afternoon. I'm LaCroix Meadows, a member of the CMC Board of Trustees and the Extension Director for Franklin County Extension. It's great to see everyone today. All of us members, guests, and speakers benefit from the many organizations listed on the back of the forum flyer who support CMC through sponsorship. Their support makes it possible for us to bring high quality, affordable programs to you every week. Our forum series titled Spotlight on Public Policy is brought to us with support from the Center for Community Solutions and today's chapter, The Opiate Epidemic, is brought to us with support from Cardinal Health. Please help me thank all of our sponsors and welcome the President and Executive Director of the Center for Community Solutions, John Corlett, to, to the stage to introduce our speakers. Uh, thank you, LaCory. It's uh, my pleasure to represent the Center for Community Solutions here this afternoon as we support the mission of the Columbus Metropolitan Club to engage people and ideas in community and conversation. For over 102 years, the Center for Community Solutions has brought research and analysis to bear on some of our communities and states most pressing social problems. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank focused on solutions to health, social and economic issues. It's hard to imagine a more tragic event than the loss of a child. Unfortunately, lethal doses of opiates and other drugs are causing death at an alarming rate in Ohio and around the nation. With the consequences of lost lives, crime, and other casualties leaving deep scars across our landscape, this epidemic shows no mercy and no bias of race, class, age, income, or family situation. It's a problem for all of us. Among the frontline witnesses to this scourge are the medical community who treat the victims and the journalists who cover the stories. So please join me in welcoming a man whose life work has been on the front lines of addiction, providing services to those in need, CEO of Mary Haven, Mr. Paul Coleman. And our host today, And our host today, the, the star of All Sides with Ann Fisher on WOSU 89.7 NPR News, Ann Fisher. Thank you. And starting us off, an American journalist known for his reporting and true tales about immigration, culture, money, drugs, and politics of the people of Mexico and the United States, our honored guest, author Sam Quiones. Sam will make opening remarks and then join Paul and Ann for conversation. Sam, the podium is yours. All right then, how's everybody today? Good, all right. Um, it's just wonderful to be back in Columbus. Um, I see several people who helped enormously on, on this book and I wanna say thanks to uh, great cop Gary Cameron back there, the Schoonovers, Ellen and Paul, somewhere and uh, Jennifer Bittinger, where is she? Right over there. Um, it's, uh, again, wonderful to be here again. Um, you know, when I started this book, well, really in Sears, began writing a proposal and then sold a proposal to a publishing house uh, middle of 2012, um, I remember uh, telling people about it. And they would ask me, oh, what's the book about? And I would say, heroin kind of bright eye and bushy-tailed heroin. And I remember getting these really strange looks, like why would anybody want to write about heroin in America today? It's not a problem that I'm aware of, these people would say. And, and um, I had sisters-in-law in, uh, in suburban Indiana who had no idea what heroin actually was. And why would you be writing about this? It was this kind of mystifying idea. Um, and I lived with that uh, uncertainty for a good amount of time, uh, understanding that I kind of contracted myself and my family up to write a book about uh, a, a problem that apparently nobody uh, thought was uh, uh, important or, or interesting or worthwhile. And uh, here I am today. <laughs> I, think, I think we could see uh, what's happening in this country, uh, all across the country, and not just here, um, has been um, uh, unprecedented in many ways and uh, extraordinarily alarming and uh, connected, I believe, to um, American culture. I thought for a long time 
that, that I was writing a book about, about, um, uh, about heroin. And uh, really, I believe I was writing, I came to re realize, in fact, that I was writing a book about America and American society and the nature of the country today uh, and who we are uh, as, as, as a country. And in fact, I believe that heroin is a kind of a, a um, the end result or the crystallization of values that we have fostered for 35 years. Um, I believe that heroin, uh, heroin's natural habitat is in uh, uh, fragmented places, places with, that have had communities shredded. I focus, of course, in the book on Portsmouth, Ohio, which has gone through that uh, quite severely, probably as severely as any town in the country. But, you know, you find this problem also in parts of, very wealthy parts of America, Charlotte, suburban Charlotte. Um, and and the, the common denominator, I've always asked myself, what, what's the common denominator? One is, of course, everyone's white. The addicts are all white. Everybody who is addicted, I've not found one person, well, I found one person, I'm sorry, who was, who was not white, who was addicted uh, in this, um, the, kind of in the last wave of addiction. But the thing that really also held everything together was um, a destruction of community. Um, I believe um, that is what has paved the way for this. Um, in, towns like, in towns like Portsmouth, of course, it's job loss, deindustrialization, jobs going to Malaysia or Mexico or wherever, just disappearing altogether. Um, the destruction of the beautiful uh, pool, Dreamland, which became kind of the, the centerpiece of the book quite, quite unexpectedly. I had no idea when I started this book. Uh, what the, the title would be, nor I had I even an inkling that the pool ever existed. But it became kind of the focus of the book because the, the pool was what held life together. Civic life revolved around this enormous, gorgeous swimming pool where, every, where, where there was always kind of room for more people. The person who owned it for many years was the uh, director of, the, I'm sorry, the uh, CEO of a local shoe company, shoe factory. He didn't really need the money for the pool. He reinvested back into the community. The pool grounds kept on growing, and the pool itself became the central plaza, the, the social plaza for the, entire, for the entire town. Life itself revolved around this pool. Kids would grow up. You know, as a toddler, you'd be in the shallow end in the middle school. You'd be in the middle end, and then uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, high school, you'd be jumping off the, off the, uh, the, the high dive. And then uh, you'd, uh, early adulthood, you'd lose your virginity out in the... the, the the grounds uh, around uh, uh, um, uh, the pool, and by the time your kid was born, they'd be back into the shallow, and that's how life, life happened. Everyone looked out for one another. You had 100 babysitters every time you walked onto the pool grounds. And um, the story, of course, of how that ended um, was, was a very, very sad one, I found, and my, uh, particularly sad my, my wife, uh, cries at Hallmark cards, but these kinds of stories really uh, bring tears to her eyes, uh, um, and my own as well, uh, to see what, what, what happened to Dreamland, but really what happened to community in America. That's why I chose that pool and that town to write about, because that is uh, a symbol for us all. Charlotte, uh, suburban Charlotte, suburban LA, uh, you know, our heroin beltway is the wealthiest suburb, suburbs of LA, you know. Uh, Simi Valley, Thousand Oaks, Moore Park, you may have heard of these places, I don't know, but uh, they are very, very nice places um, and, um, and extraordinarily ravaged by, by heroin addiction uh, uh, today. Destroying community is, uh, that's like heroin's, a, 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 a town where there is no community, where isolation exists, where, where suburbs have been built into, uh, isolation has been built into suburbs and we call it prosperity. That's heroin's natural habitat. Places where people don't know each other. You can be on the, on, the, on, in, on the internet talking across the world with somebody and not know who's across the street from you, lives across the street. Your kids don't go outside. Dreamland gets destroyed in 1993, gets covered up and is, uh, is now a strip mall. Um, these were all stories that to me talked about how this happened. You know, it happens when we fragment, when we isolate. And to me, it's, it's, it's no coincidence. It's really no coincidence that in this day and age, now the final expression of all that is widespread heroin abuse. Because we have a country have turned our back on what's most valuable in favor of what is most valued, in a sense, or, or prized. 
big houses and, and all the rest. And I think that that is a big part of it. Of course, there's poor communities like, like Portsmouth that have gone through their own um, destruction of community. But it's also in, in Portsmouth, I think, real quickly, I don't want to take too much time because I know we have a lot of um, things to talk about here. And I want to hear questions from you all. But, but the reason I also focused on Portsmouth was because there is where after, what, 30 years, 35 years, of destruction of community, you are also seeing some really exhilarating signs of, of, of American resilience. And American, America, the, the great tendency in America to take control of your future. Um, instead of just, as the town did for many years, leave it to somebody else, leave it to financiers on Wall Street, leave it to the Chicago School of Economics to tell them that they weren't worth anything. The town is now, seems to me, in certain very important ways to be saying, we're going to take, it, take control of our future now. We're not going to allow these things. You know, the savior, saving of the, the shoelace factory uh, in, um, in Portsmouth, I thought was extraordinarily important in that. Uh, the reform of city government is also very important. They're, they're saying, we're going to be professional. We're going to be modern about this. We're going to use modern municipal governance now to, to run this town and not have it be kind of improvised and, and just uh, uh, shoddy the way it was, frankly, for 35, for many, several decades. And, of course, along with this, you get now in, in Portsmouth, uh, last time I was there, a recovery population. That's about 10% of the town. 2,000 people when I was last there were in recovery for opiate addiction in the t city of Portsmouth, Ohio. That is an amazing thing. It's also very, very healthy for one reason. Portsmouth is getting an injection of what in other places is given to towns by Mexican workers. Mexicans, I spent, as uh, uh, John said earlier, I spent a lot of time in Mexico, wrote two books about Mexico. Mexican immigra immigrants are barometers of economic health. No Mexicans in, in New Orleans before Katrina, for a very good reason. No Mexicans in Detroit. Mexicans go where the jobs are. They bring a lot of things and a lot of costs, that's true, but they also bring a lot of energy, dynamism, and willing to walk through walls to get ahead, to do anything, gratitude for a, a chance at, at remaking their lives. And strangely enough, that's exactly what people in recovery also bring. So it's, it's almost, it's dawned on me when I was down there in Portsmouth, it's almost as if people who are in recovery are kind of like a new workforce moving into, into um, into Portsmouth, same people, same bodies, a new attitude. That is why I also went back, I spent a lot of time in Portsmouth because I think that town can show us a lot about where we can go. There's a, a, a ton of problems in that town. But, uh, and it looks awful at times. I went down there going, the first time going, yikes. I'm not sure this is my country. But I kept going back and I found out it was. Very exhilarating way. You know, it was, it was taking control of its future in the way that heroin does not like, in the, heroin, in the way that heroin seeks to undermine. Heroin is all about negativity, well, fatalism, well, we can't do anything, well, I might as well get high. And so, um, my feeling is that, that uh, one of the reasons I, I, I uh, uh, came to this area is because this is a, a big part of where it started, and uh, I think in some areas, some, in some, some cases, you can see that perhaps this is also um, where you find a solution out of it. Uh, with that, I think I'm just going to end, and I would, uh, I'm not sure what we do next, except for the, I sit down and we all talk. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, you know, I've done shows on, uh, yeah, I've been on the air for six years now. I've done shows on the heroin addiction problem in places like Worthington. We had the chief of police on the show, right? I've done shows about the pill mills problem down in southern Ohio uh, and across the state as it, as it swept the state. Uh, when I talked about the pill mills and the opiate addiction through the pill mills, nobody mentioned heroin. And when I did the show about the heroin addiction problem in su nice suburbs like Worthington, nobody mentioned uh, oxycodone. Nobody mentioned oxycontin at that time. Um, Paul Coleman, can you kind of connect the dots for us uh, real quick there? Yeah. The dots are easy to connect. Understand that we're talking primarily right now in our community and throughout the state about an epidemic of heroin. That is a natural opiate. 
But there are other opiates that are available. There are synthetics, Oxycontin, Vicodin, fentanyl. Those kinds of drugs are available, and particularly the prescription drugs get a lot of people started using opiates. I might, by the way, add, and it's important, particularly when I see some people in this audience who have been materially helpful to us in the recovery services business by reducing the supply of opiates, they're here today. And I just want to tell you that the Ohio General Assembly, as well as the administration of the governor, and particularly the attorney general, have been extremely helpful in reducing the supply of prescription opiates. But, Anne, your question is right on point. They go together, and just a quick story, and then I'll turn it back to you. A typical adult patient story at Mary Haven used to go like this at the beginning of the real epidemic. About a year and a half ago, I hurt my back, so I went to get a prescription, and I found that it worked pretty well, and I found it worked really well. And then my physician said, you know, we need to wean you off a little bit of it. And then I found another physician. And then that physician started to wean me off. And then somebody said, you can get it on the street. And you could, but it was expensive. And then someone said, but it's really just heroin. And heroin's a lot cheaper. And I had one patient at Mary Haven tell me that he'd worked all his life and he never thought he'd end up putting a needle in his veins. So Sam, how did the purveyors of the heroin down in Mexico figure out how to uh, puncture the market in a place like uh, Portsmouth, Ohio? Um, well, I mean, mostly they, they came to Columbus, but um, you know, I, I think, what happened here was pure coincidence. Basically, the, the, there's one guy who did it, one, one man, and I interviewed him at, at length, and, and I think I've confirmed through various sources, DEA and others, that, that, that he was the guy who did this. Before um, um, the late 90s, you had no heroin in this area at all. I talked with the guys at the uh, Comp Drug, the methadone clinic, and guys who go back many, many years in this, and we had no heroin. It was the, it, the stuff that would come would be the worst quality, you know. Um, so in, uh, um, backtrack a little bit, uh, one man, uh, uh, a Mexican-American guy from uh, San Fernando Valley in California, a longtime heroin addict, uh, I tell this story in the book, but um, uh, is in, finds himself in prison in Nevada where he meets a guy from one, this one small town that is so important in the story, I believe, Jalisco in the state of Nayarit. Nayarit is a, town, is a state about 12, 15 hours south of Arizona due, on the Pacific Coast. And they have a conversation. The guy goes, we have this system, that he, the guy he meets, we have this system that my brothers and my cousins are using in Honolulu and Denver and, and, uh, and, and Portland, various places, where we sell heroin. It's kind of like pizza delivery. We have, very crucial to this system, access to all the supply you'd ever want to use because heroin has been, uh, poppies have been grown in Mexico since the early 1900s. They grow very nicely in the, in the Pacific Coast mountain range, the Sierra uh, Madre along the Pacific Coast. And we buy the opium goo from the Indians who grow it and they harvest it and they sell it to us and we know how to cook it into black tar heroin. Right? And, for, and we have this system supplying it like pizza so the uh, addicts call and we have drivers driving it around all over. What we don't know, what we don't have is somebody who understands the addict world. We don't speak English. We don't really want to speak English. We don't want to know anything about this country. We just want to sell dope. We need someone who has an entree into that world that could open up that world to us in a way. This guy was that guy. So they get out together, parole in 93, 94. One guy gets deported, he comes back. They, they, they uh, set up several stores. They call them stores, little crews 
first in Reno, Portland, Salt Lake, et cetera, various places. Over several years, this guy gets very connected to the town. He buys property, has a wife down there as a kid, loans money, offers jobs selling heroin in, the, in, in his stores to the poor kids who need work. And after a while, he's very connected in this town. But he, at, at one point, he, he meets a guy in Reno who tells him, if you, there's no, you need to go to Columbus with this stuff. If you go to Columbus, you will make a million. There's nothing like this in Columbus. You will make a killing. If, and I got a friend, I mean, I've got an uncle, he hangs out at the methadone clinic. You go find him, you, you, that's, and that's what happened, basically. He decides that he is going to go off on his own. June 11th, 1998, he flies from California to Indianapolis first. Uh, there's a tornado. The reason, the reason I know this is there's a tornado. He describes perfectly this tornado, and there's uh, reports from newspaper reports that describe in detail the de same details he, he, he tells me. Uh, the, he doesn't know what, we don't know what tornadoes are in California. I'm terrified of tornadoes. I don't even know what the hell those things are. <laughs> I prefer like any kind of earthquake is going to be fine with me. Just keep those tornadoes away. He feels the same way. He le leaves, goes to Dayton, doesn't like Dayton, moves to Columbus. This is why these, these guys, I focused on these guys because they are the, the harbingers of a new kind of tra drug trafficking that does not use guns and not about shoot 'em ups and drug trafficking, uh, the, the, the Bloods and the Crips or the Colombians, the way they all did things, or for that matter, the, the prohibitionists back in the 30s you know, or the 20s with their Tommy guns and the drive by shootings. You know, this is a new kind of drug trafficking that focuses on customer service, on marketing, on, on, on branding. And he brings that here in uh, around about maybe July of 1998. Mm -hmm. and, um, but another part of this story is that, he, that he's important in is that um, within a couple of months, he sells. He brings a couple of boys up from the town. They're selling. They're doing their whole thing with the balloons and the mouth and the pizza, kind of the, the pizza style delivery and all that. And one junkie tells him, hey, man, you got to go to Wheeling. You go to Wheeling, you will make a killing. And that's how these things spread. The word of mouth, you need to go to over here, you'll make a killing, and that's enough for them to go. This guy goes to Wheeling, and he meets a woman, he tells me, who's a heroin addict, who has a house and an Eldora a new truck. And he had never met a heroin addict who had a house and a new truck. And he's like, wow, how'd she get that? And she then tries to ch switch, uh, trade him a bottle of pills for his heroin, and he looks at the pills, he has never seen this before. What is Oxycontin, he says. Well, she is an addict, he's an addict, they speak a language that you and I just don't speak. And they begin to have a conversation and she tells him of all the, the, the properties of OxyContin that are so much like heroin. And she begins to say if, if uh, the people who are on OxyContin soon will be heroin addicts. And that, he is the first one, these guys with their system, uh, but this guy in particular is the first one to figure out the new pill market and the pill market that is then going to become a heroin market if they just hang out, if they just are patient and push it and give away free samples and hang out at the methadone clinic giving away free dope. Right, because even as, you know, the Attorney General's office is doing this work to yeah. curb the tide of the prescription drug market, um, there, there, there isn't necessarily the backdrop for, pe there's nowhere for people to go because they're still addicted. Right? I mean, yeah. Paul Coleman? Uh, that, that's absolutely right, Ann. Uh, what we saw is the progression from prescription opiates, synthetic opiates, to heroin. And we think right now that heroin is clearly the drug of choice for most patients that we see at Mary Haven. And Sam's got the history right, because if we go back to 1997, 1998, uh, we ask our patients at Mary Haven, what is your drug of choice? And to be honest with you, many of them will say, and it's unprompted, pretty much anything I can get, but my preference is, and we write that down as number one. Uh, in 97, 98, about 20% of our patients were saying opiates, which almost always meant heroin. These were older patients who had a long experience with the drug. And just in 2014, 75% of our patients at Mary Haven tell us that heroin is their drug of choice. I suspect that's also 
younger folks who have gotten addicted to like in the last, what, 15 uh, years or so? Uh, well, you know, in some cases, Sam, tragically within the last uh, year or so. Well, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. they're still being prescribed the pills for legitimate reasons at the beginning. Well, they, they, they are still, despite the good job that we've done here in the state of Ohio, there's still some diversion going on. And I would, I would call the attention of, of everyone here to the efforts our community has made through chain pharmacies, through drug stores, through uh, grocery stores, uh, to basically say, if you have prescription opiates and you're finished with your prescription, but you have some left over, don't leave them around. Uh, about, by the way, about 15% of our adolescent patients at Mary Haven tell us that opiates are their drug of choice. Fortunately, that breaks down to the vast majority being prescription drugs. But how do they get the prescription drugs? Not, not like adults, not through legitimate prescriptions. They get them because the drugs are diverted from legitimate sources, most often from somebody who steals them from a relative. And because that's because the people are being prescribed far too many of these pills for what they actually need, and almost all those pills, though, have, the, n pharmacy robberies are just minuscule. There's no, oh, very yeah. small. It's, almost all those pills have been prescribed at one point. That really just, resonated yeah, yeah. with me after I gave birth. I had one stitch, <laughs> and uh, they gave me 80 Vicodin. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. Did anybody else out here have that experience uh, where you sure. get lots of drugs sure. for nothing? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, but not anymore. <laughs> no. I don't know anymore. anymore. I know I got my appendix out in 2009, and I, I got 60 Vicodin to take home with me. And the, the message in that bottle was kind of the message of the, the modern medicine of the, today, or for many years, which was these pills are virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain. That's the message when you get 60 to and take home Where did home that message you. come from? You write about that at Right, length. that's a big part of the book because I, I, my, I entered this story, I backed into this story because of my experience in Mexico. I was all about, the, the question was all, how is it that so many Mexican heroin traffickers are doing such banner business and why are the seizures way up at the border and all that mm -hmm. stuff? Why would this be the case? I, I have been a crime reporter Years ago, um, it had been a long time, I thought, since heroin was anything but a kind of a, you know, it was a 70s, you know, I grew yeah. up in the 70s. When I was a kid, I watched all those movies, you know, French Connection and Serpico, sure. great movies. Uh, but that was the last days of the heroin yeah. problem, really. Back that, in the you know? 70s. Yeah. And so my question was, coming from 10 years in Mexico and extensive uh, traveling throughout the country, um, why are these guys doing such banner business, you know? And, all the, the pain revolution that I then talk about in the book happened while I was in Mexico. I was oblivious to it. I had no idea what this was. Um, but come to find out that there was this revolution in medi modern medicine brought by probably well-meaning people who had lived through a period when opiate painkillers were never used for any reason. That was equally bizarre. People could be in a hospice, palliative care, dying of cancer, horrible pain and still they wouldn't be given these pills because there was this really, really fierce um, uh, stigma attached to addiction or fear of them getting addicted, even though they maybe only had six months to live. You, you know. So doctors who grew up watching that were seared by that experience and horrified by it. And their idea was, we've got to do something to liberalize the use of opiates. So what they do is they begin a kind of a Really, it takes on a, almost like a religious crusade, a kind of a fervor to change the way people, doctors in particular, uh, uh, their attitudes and why they should be prescribing more. We've got an epidemic of pain. Uh, they, they turn to um, some very, very thin, extraordinarily thin, I hesitate to even call it research. There was no research, but papers that mention that maybe this isn't really a problem, that you can prescribe these pills without much addictive, addictive risk. And they hold that up as proof. And really, really, two, three pieces of two or three of these documents convince an entire generation of docs, med schools, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of other factors that go into it. But basically, what ends up happening is conventional wisdom is these pills are virtually yeah. non addictive when yeah. used to p treat pain. They yeah. are, the, the other buzz phrase is um, less than 1% of all patients prescribe these, pain, these pills get addicted. And so you have then 
a, a, a kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to pain management, which is just blast pills at it. And so, and all of a sudden, you get uh, pills prescribed for a crazy thing. I still, to this day, do not understand why you would get any pills at all to get your after wisdom teeth are extracted. And I got my all, all my wisdom teeth extracted, and I got Advil. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a problem, you know. Mm -hmm. And now you get Vicodin. And then mm -hmm. the other thing is, no one explains that when I had my my appendix out, they gave me a big whack of pills, you know, and it was uh, no explanation of what hydrocodone was, which is the active drug in, um, in, uh, in, in, in Vicodin. Um, no explanation of what I should do with those pills. Uh, nothing. Just take them. It's fine, you know. And this is, so the story, the, the question that I posed initially, why are these guys from Mexico doing this great banner business? I had, I had to go even farther back into a world that I knew, did not know at all to, uh, about you know, the whole story of pills and pain management and the pain revolution. And, and so, so this, this drug scourge ends up being unique in the history of drug problems in America since World War II, which is the only one that did not start with the mafia, did not start with drug traffickers or street drug dealers, and rather started with legitimate uh, medicine. All right, so let's make another leap mm -hmm. here, though. What accounts for the surge in heroin overdoses? Is this a different kind of heroin than we remember we we knew of and heard about back yeah. in the 70s? Well, well, and it is. Uh, forgive me, but it's a good analogy to marijuana, which is a topic of discussion uh, these days in our state. The marijuana that we have today is much different than the marijuana baby boomers grew up with. And that's the case with heroin also. It is stronger and realize what pushers do. Pushers sell a product and they have to differentiate that product. Sam has given you a great description you know, in the book about how the model is pizza delivery. And that is true throughout all the communities in, in which Mary Haven does business and throughout the state of Ohio. But the point is that pushers differentiate the product. A recent troubling trend has been the mixing of heroin with fentanyl. And that can be extremely, extremely dangerous. It is anywhere from 30 to 50 times more powerful than opiates. And the Ohio Department of Health says that this accounts for the rise in heroin-related deaths. So we, we've talked about the problem. Can I have a, just a couple minutes to talk a little bit about the solution from the Demand reduction side? Okay. Can I do that? <laughs> okay. Because I, I think it's important to know. The problem is huge. It requires two responses. We've talked a great deal about supply reduction. And Sam, I think we're doing a good job here in Ohio getting those pill mills closed, changing the way physicians prescribe. So I think we're doing a good job in terms of supply reduction. Demand rejection is the business I'm in at Mary Haven. And what we find is good responses in helping us do our job from both the state of Ohio and the counties in which we do business. The Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services has a focus on eradicating demand for opiate use by funding innovative types of programs, such as the use of Vivitrol, which is a medicine that we use at Mary Haven that helps addicts get off opiates. The Franklin County Adam Board here in Franklin County has invested over nearly $10 million in care for patients who are seeking help so that they no longer have to use opiates. And I'd like to point out that the Franklin County Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board does have a levy on the ballot in November. It is issue 14, and I would respectfully request your careful consideration so that we can better care for people in our community 
who see the problem in themselves and want to do something about it. Can I say one thing about sure. what Paul was saying before? Yes. And that is that, um, yeah, the reason that heroin is more, uh, has been more potent is because, is, is because it comes from shorter distance. Um, when I was a kid in the 70s, our heroin, most of it came from Turkey, Burma, uh, places like that. In the mm -hmm. 80s was another cha major change. Uh, most of our heroin began the, the, fr coming from Latin America. Her heroin is a commodity. It, it, it obeys the price and, and, and a lot of that it obeys a, a lot of things having to do with, with, with cost of getting the drugs here. And um, so if you have to come from Mexico, it's a whole lot cheaper than coming from, say, Burma or Afghanistan or Turkey or wherever it was coming from uh, before. The other thing that governs the price of heroin is how much it gets stepped on. The longer distance, the more people you have to sell to, the more it gets diluted and um, the, the weaker it gets. But heroin from uh, Mexico and, and, and to some degree Colombia ha has to go through far f less of that. I would say my hunch is, although I'm un un not, um, and that's why we have heroin that is cheaper than ever. Okay, you can like, maintain a heroin addiction for about 50 to 60 bucks daily today, whereas before it would be well over 100 uh, in the 70s and 80s, I think. Um, uh, but again, keep in mind that, that heroin is a commodity, and that's, and, and, and the way you change it is by what you add to it. Um, and so, uh, uh, fentanyl, to my mind, is. Um, a desperate measure. It's pro probably people who have had their bought, bought heroin that's been stepped on so much that there's not any heroin left in it. And so in order to boost it, you got to add something to it that'll give it a boost because otherwise people will get out and, you, and no one will buy it from you. It probably also is because word now is out that it's extraordinarily deadly, is probably people selling it one time. It's not people who have a business model based on continual daily sales to their customers. They want to keep their customers alive, obviously. It's not altruistic, it's business. It's business, pure and simple. But it's also very good business to keep your clients alive. So selling heroin with fentanyl in it would seem to me to be a desperate measure by someone who doesn't really care. It's got a certain quantity, wants to get rid of it and move on and not have a, a, a supply uh, a, 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 a bunch of customers who, who are, are um, uh, you want to cultivate and continue uh, to keep alive. That's my comments on. Okay, it stuff. is the Columbus Metropolitan Club's tradition to take audience questions. Please step to the microphone, give us your name, and ask your question. And thank you in <coughs> advance for not making long editorial comments. <laughs> so please step to the, um, <coughs> and in the meantime, if no one else is going to ask, but Please do. Um, the microphones over there. Uh, microphones, I'm sorry, they're right over there. <coughs> Hi, my name is Felicia Lillian. Um, I had a quick question. You would mentioned um, pharmaceutical regulation and medical treatment as solutions to the problem, and I was wondering if you had any opinion on legal policy and whether or not criminalization or decriminalization of drug use had a negative or positive effect. That's a really good, great question. Um, Paul Coleman, any thoughts about that? Or? Yes. Okay. I, I have some thoughts. Um, <laughs> Western society for 5,000 years has legalized one drug. It is still the drug of choice running a close second to heroin and it is called alcohol. Most people can use alcohol safely, some people can't. We have one legal drug. I can't see what we would gain as a society from legalizing other drugs. There are massive public health concerns in doing it. There are law enforcement concerns in doing it. There are workplace safety concerns in doing it. And finally, yes, there are the children. And once we legalize something, we say, okay, it's okay. And I think as a society that we're doing just fine with that one legal, very potent drug, 
Most people, again, can use it very successfully, but I just don't see any advantage in further legalizing drugs. Sam? Um, wow. Well, yeah, I, that's, I, my feeling is that um, folks who have thought, who, who have proposed legalization have not thought uh, deeply enough about what needs to be done. In California, we have probably one of the worst marijuana laws in the country because it said, oh, marijuana is legal because it's probably a medicine and go ahead and, you know, whatever kind of thing. But really, that's kind of what I read the thing going, what kind of law is that? I was in Mexico when they passed it, all right? I didn't vote for it, all right? But um, there's also, there's some other issues too that, um, first of all, in, with regard to marijuana, it's now, uh, marijuana is now 20, 30, 25, 30% THC. That's the active compound in, the, in marijuana. That rises to the level of LSD, in my view. 30% uh, THC marijuana is like a, a recipe for disaster. However, the way that happened was through prohibition. That's why we have 30% marijuana, THC marijuana, right? Uh, you had this during prohibition of alcohol too. You had all kinds of wacky alcohol, the wood turpentine and all this kind of stuff. There was no regulation. The people who have proposed, however, regulation, uh, a legalization of marijuana, in my view, have not thought deeply enough about all that needs to be done if you're going to do that. I happen to believe that marijuana probably needs to be legalized because I'm afraid, I, I know where dr Mexican drug cartels get most of their money. It's from marijuana, okay? And that, the other drugs change. Marijuana is constant. That's where all, it is the gateway drug for all Mexican drug traffickers. That's how you get into drug trafficking, selling marijuana. The problem is that people again are thinking like, well, all marijuana should just be legalized. I have, in, have no, and uh, uh, in, in no way support the idea that you, could legal, you should legalize uh, even 10% THC marijuana. I think it should be, you should use the, the, the alcohol template. Beer is what, 3%, wine's 4% or whatever, maximum 6%. And that, and that the money, the other thing that people have not thought deeply about is the regulatory scheme that you are gonna then have to fund. Because you are, Paul's right, that, that the drug that ends up being legal is the drug that people are going to use most often. And alcohol is a perfect example of that. So if you want to legalize marijuana, you also have to, within the framework of a, of, of a law, talk about how you're going to pay for the, all the inspectors to go out and make sure that all those, those weed plants are, are growing nothing but 3 or 5% THC marijuana. Uh, uh, CHP, or what do you call it here, Ohio State Police or Highway Patrol, um, to uh, 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 train them in how to view this, um, uh, a whole, and, and then of course an enormous public safety, uh, public campaign, publicity campaign, telling people not to use it, uh, because you don't want people to use it. You don't. It's, it's legalizing it does not mean you should. You want people to to use it. That so. My problem is I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I do think that the people who, are, who have, at least in California, who have proposed legalization have really, really not thought deeply about all that goes along with legalizing some of these drugs. And all that money that's supposedly going to, the state's going to recoup in tax money, all that's spent ahead of time. And for probably a decade at least, maybe two. Uh, while, you're, while you're creating these new bureaucracies and, this new tech and these new strategies and so on. When it comes to heroin, uh, whether we should legalize heroin, my feeling is we already have a legal opiate uh, for, for maintenance of addiction, and that's methadone. And it's got its drawbacks, it's got its good and its bad, but it, it is not, heroin's euphoria and crash goes like this, you know, several times a day. Methadone's like this. You can actually have a life that, where you think about other things besides dope. On, on methadone. I don't suggest people go out and get addicted to methadone. I'm just saying that you've already got a, a legal opiate. And, and why her heroin seems like the, the only reason heroin survived past like 1915 is because drug traffickers learned that it was a really great drug for selling illegally on the street. It's not a good painkiller really, or, or its benefits are far outweighed by everything else. And, and so if, uh, my feeling is if, if we already have a legal opiate, it's actually a pretty good thing. You go to most methadone clinics are widely varying, and some are awful and some are great. But, you know, it's dirt cheap. It's liquid. You take it. It's, it's, we've got that scheme in place, and I'm not sure what legalizing heroin would 
serve, basically. Thanks for that question. Appreciate it. Um, I'm Dr. Chris Sherrington. I actually practiced anesthesia, graduated uh, medical school in 98, right when the decade of pain was about to begin. We were taught in medical school that uh, we were causing the elderly and the invalid to suffer by not prescribing enough, and that was pushed actually quite heavily in residency. Um, but the reason we were taught was that the legal system for the previous 15 years had been uh, actually incarcerating physicians for not treating pain. So in some ways, um, our response to not treating enough pain was to scare an entire generation of physicians into doing it. And that's, I just wanted to make one comment. Do you see the reverse as part of the solution for the society as we start to prosecute for over-treating and then by the law of unintended consequences causing those relatives to disperse drugs? That's really one, one question. The other one is, what role do you think naltrexone uh, or other uh, fast-acting reversal agents can uh, play in, in preventing youth death from opioid overdose? Doctor, I'd be happy to quickly respond to your last question first. Uh, naltrexone is a very valuable medicine to use for people who are experiencing problems with uh, overdoses of heroin particularly. So I think we ought to look at that, and indeed we are in the state of Ohio. It's now available without prescription. That's a good thing. It saves lives. I'm in the business of treating addicts. I can't treat addicts if they are dead. Your first question, I think, is well taken. The law of unintended consequences is running rampant throughout this entire problem. <laughs> and I think we have to look very carefully now, uh, particularly physicians who specialize in pain management, to make sure that if we do bring the sanctions of the law against them, we must have very, very clear evidence that they are violating acceptable standards of practice. Your point is well taken, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Tia Moretti, and my question is about treatment and capacity. So if my loved one or myself, I want to receive treatment, how are we addressing that ability to get them in when they're ready or when I'm ready? Um, as it stands, keeping them there long enough yeah. to really address yes. it. That's a, the exactly, of time and is making a big sure problem. it's a comprehensive treatment program. Yeah. So, what are we doing in the state of Ohio about that and to address it? It's a very good question. It's something that I don't think about daily. I think about it hourly, because Mary Haven, like any other provider of behavioral health care in our state, faces great over demand for services. It's always facile to say, well, the answer is more money. But I think you need to look at the capacity of the behavioral health care system in our state as well as nationwide. That's a long-term solution, but you need to look at it. The other thing that you need to look at is the capacity of our medical education system to produce the healers that we need in the business. All that is well and good, and I tell myself that all the time. But when I get a call from someone like you who has a loved one, and I say, detoxification at Mary Haven has 24 beds. We now, today, by the way, today we have 28 patients in a 24-bed unit, okay? And I say, Let's get the patient to be on a waiting list. We'll work with that patient. We'll get him or her in as quickly as we can. That's not a good answer. And I wish I had an answer, and I'm sorry. Can I say that um, on that topic, one thing, I don't know a whole lot about the ins and outs of uh, treatment in, in Ohio, I defer most definitely to Paul on that. But I, I think what this epidemic is doing uh, on another level is really forcing us to rethink the, the, form, the, 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 sh the form that jail takes. Uh, jail um, is a cost now. People are put in jail to await their trial. Um, 
uh, or they're doing their um, misdemeanor, in California anyway, this is how it works, you know, you do your misdemeanor time in jail. Uh, and it's largely, you spend it in a vegetative state, talking about your criminal past with all these other guys, uh, trying to avoid fights or get involved in fights, depending on your nature, and bartering stuff. And it's entirely non-productive, entirely wa big waste of time. Um, we, I'm quite sure that, that uh, Ohio is like the rest of the country. It's been overwhelmed. Its infrastructure, rehab infrastructure has been overwhelmed. There is, though, I think rethinking jail to include not as a current way it is, you know, where, where you've got occasional volunteers show up to do a 12-step meeting or a preacher shows up to do some prayer or Bible study or whatever it has, happens to be, but actually converting wings of the jail to effective rehab clinics. They're doing this, saw this in, in Kentucky in a few jails, and, and that is the way to cheaply, I'm sorry, relatively cheaply, they're, they're doing it in Kenton County and Northern Kentucky without really asking for more budget, uh, converting a wing of 70 beds to entire rehab, and what I mean by that is uh, rehab from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, you're working on your rehab. You have to apply to be a part of that wing. You wake up at 6 in the morning, 6.30, you make your bed, you do those. There's, there's time for physical exercise, there's time for prayer and meditation, there's 12 steps, there's a variety of things, there's GED classes, etc. All of this with, with an eye to making jail into an investment instead of a, just a, a a throwing money out down the drain, which is what it is today. It's a, just a cost is all it is, right? And so opiate addiction in America, I believe, is forcing this on many communities that had never thought of this before, or never thought that they had to, never really given the thought to what shape does jail take when my boy's in there? Um, is it just vegetating and talking about where to get the best dope when you get out and all this stuff, or is it being among people who are all motivated that way. Will it work for everybody? Well, uh, we, I think we know that relapse is a big part of this story. But it's, and so, no, maybe not. But it certainly seems to me to be a way where you can convert re relatively quickly and relatively cheap, cheaply new bed space, new, new uh, infrastructure into um, uh, or just uh, come up with new infrastructure for this problem because this is the problem across, across the country and it really what it depends on almost more than anything is a change of mind, you know, a change of political will. People saying, you know, uh, really jail's a waste of money right now and what we need to do is try something different and maybe it will be an investment so that in the long run we will have 25% uh, of those guys not coming back whereas probably before all those guys would have come back, you know. So, okay, we have time idea. just one more question. Um, thank you, Jane Scott. Uh, quick question, maybe a bit of a rhetorical question. Maybe it's a question for all of us. How quick are we to ask for a pill, a prescription, instead of looking to our doctors for maybe some other solutions to our aches and pains? Jane, I think we should all ask our healthcare practitioners when something is prescribed. Is this the least aggressive intervention we can start with? And I also think we, should, we need to ask ourselves, what, are, are our own, what is our own responsibility and accountability and our own wellness? We need to say, um, I'll stop drinking soda. I'll, stop, mm -hmm. I'll start walking more. I'll definitely stop smoking. Uh, I don't understand anybody who smokes anymore, honest to God. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it's, it, we have spent, a lot of what doctors are facing, a lot of reason they turned to pills was because they had patients who were demanding that doctors fix them. And there was not a whole lot of accountability or, or, or participation in your own uh, wellness, you know, the, the, on the part of patients. They just wanted the doctor to push a button. The only way to push a button is with a pill, and we all know where that leads. So, I, I mean, I really do believe we need to give doctors a break here a little bit as American consumers, as Americans for whom the idea of accountability is a fundamental part of our system and our history and our culture, and say, we'll be accountable first for our own wellness. And then, yeah, we ask all the right questions when we get them, and what is hydrocodone, you know, that kind of question is, of course, valid. That's it. The book is called Dreamland. Um, thank you so much. I read the whole thing. So, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Paul Coleman. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful discussion. Thank you to each of you. 
Remember that you can view and share all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio channel and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Let's thank our sponsors, the Center for Community Solutions, Cardinal Health, and our speakers, Sam Kionis, Paul Coleman, and Ann Fisher. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you at CMC again soon. Have a great afternoon.